Hey, EO Alive. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. And I have a special guest. Uh, Jim Whit Whitbeck is here with me. And Jim has had some bombshell news for all of us. I know that you, you've probably known about this for a long time, but uh, let's, let's, Jim owns uh, Blue Mountain Outfitters downtown in La Grande. Uh, he moved here uh, and we'll get to talking about that, but I think you moved here and then you started the business shortly after being here. I did, and yeah. and uh, you've, you've invested in our downtown community uh, personally and with your efforts. And, and so, uh, let's, let's get to the news that everybody's curious about first. And that is, so what are the new plans? Uh, what are you doing? And then we'll kind of back up and, and talk about a little bit about your story, how you got here and so on and so forth. Sure. Yeah. So, um, my family and I, uh, were moving to, uh, Corvallis in August and, uh, I will be starting a, PhD program in business at uh, Oregon State in the fall. And so um, we are working on on finding a buyer for the business for Blue Mountain Outfitters and packing up the house and, and getting ready to head out. So, Wow. So, and all of this in the middle of COVID. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky to say the least. We, uh, uh, my wife is immunocompromised. And so we've been uh, fully quarantined this whole time. And so uh, figuring out how to uh, make that transition uh, with those limitations is pretty tricky, but we're, we're making it work one step at a time. So good. So so now tell me, so you're going after your doctorates. That obviously means that you have an undergraduate degree and a master's. Some people might not even know that. So, so you came to Legrand with a master's degree and started a business. So yeah, why don't, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about your education and then talk about what led you to Legrand sure. and, and then how, what led you to deciding to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I got my, BA in philosophy uh, from U of O, um, and then I uh, was in, uh, I went from there to uh, management consulting in Los Angeles for a few years, and then uh, was in organizational culture uh, for Lenovo, a computer company in Raleigh for a few years, and then came back to Portland. Um, I was looking for kind of a change of pace. Uh, I ended up uh, entering into a master's program at Portland State uh, in supply chain management, and a friend of mine, um, it was an, it was an online part time uh, program, and so a friend of mine was kind of taking over his family business here in the Grand, and um, I thought kind of just you know on the side it might be fun to help him do that, and so I came out here for that, uh, and then. I was in January of uh, 2014, and uh, within a few months, I had really kind of fallen for the community. I really liked it here. I really um, enjoy the community, and I just kind of felt like I wanted to kind of stick around for a bit. And I guess I, I would say I saw an opportunity that there there wasn't an outdoor store, to my knowledge, between Boise and Tri Cities, and so. Uh, that seemed kind of funny to me, given that there um, are just an incredible amount of outdoor recreation opportunities out here. And so I started the business. Um, I was still only halfway through the program. So I was actually finishing up my master's while starting the store. Um, and um, yeah, that was in spring of, uh, it was just within a few months. So we opened the store in uh, mid-June of 2014. So from philosophy to supply chain management yep. to being an entrepreneur. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, the, so, so uh, one of the things that I guess people maybe don't uh, initially think about with philosophy as an undergraduate degree is that it primarily, it, it teaches you how to think. Um, how to take an argument and kind of pick it apart and put it back together and say, you know, come up with ways that it could have been a better argument. And um, so 
that really actually helped me a lot when I was in the court of sort of corporate business world um, in terms of solving problems. You know, as a consultant, you kind of are a hired gun. You get to go in and uh, solve the problems in the organization that they can't solve themselves and stuff. Um, it's, it's pretty fun. Um, I was interested in supply chain management because uh, that's kind of like what the what makes the world go around uh, and at least in our economy. And so I was interested in that from the standpoint of, of being interested in just how sort of complex systems work, uh, but then also, um, frankly, the impact that supply chains can have on the environment and the communities that they work in. Um, you know, a, a, a socially conscious, environmentally conscious supply chain can have um, a ton of benefits to the community that it works in and uh, even, you know, globally, uh, obviously. And um, a, you know, less um, supply chains that don't have those values can have pretty significant detracting effects, you know. And so um, that was an important thing for me. I, I guess I had kind of initially planned on taking that into the corporate world, but I sort of instead fell for the grant in the meantime. And so I uh, set that aside. I would say that it, it was helpful for me in the store in the sense that we are the last link, the store is the last link in, in the supply chain uh, for the outdoor industry. You know, we're, we're getting the thing to the customers after it's been built and put together and all that. Um, and so the supply chain degree was, was helpful for that, but not necessarily the first, you know, application that you would typically see. Um, and, um, you know, I think it, it, and, and obviously the philosophy has also sort of driven some of the values that have been really important to me, uh, and how I manage the business and, um, you know, the service to the community and whatnot too. Well, and I've appreciated your thoughtfulness whenever, um, because you, you are a thinker and that that is that serves you well. I mean, I think the first time you and I met was on a committee for Main Street. Yep. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> I think that was the first time I was actually ever in your shop and and spent some time with you there, got to know you. And I just always appreciated and have always appreciated your thoughtfulness. Um, but you you're not a typical business owner, uh, which which is not a bad thing at all. It's just, uh, you know, um, you're, uh, you're not a big personality guy and normally sole proprietors, they kind of lean on that big personality side, sure, you know, sure, sure, so, sure. but, uh, uh, man, I've just, I appreciate, I've appreciated the business that you brought, the investment that you were right in the middle of downtown. Uh, you know, since then you've had some competition come in uh, big five has come in and <clears throat> you've, you've survived that. Uh, yeah. so talk a little bit about, you know, what was, what was the transition like for you to be a sole proprietor? Uh, were there any like huge surprises of like, wow, I, I, I was not prepared for this or I didn't expect this. You know, it, I, I really enjoy, I really enjoy being in the steep part of the learning curve more than anything. And so I, I hadn't even worked in a retail store before I started the store. So I, I didn't know, I didn't know anything. And, um, and that was what was fun about it. Honestly, uh, I was very lucky that I chose to do that in a community that ended up having the amount of patience with my learning curve as, as Legrand did. Um, but you know, I really, um, I think it it's it it was really it, it was fun to learn the business sort of in real time. Um, it was fun to learn more about Legrand through the business, uh, to kind of build relationships with it. Because um, I didn't I didn't know anybody when I moved here, and so it kind of like gave me an excuse to sort of meet people, I guess, <laughs> and kind of you know learn about the community. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things about being a business owner um, that I guess surprised me a little bit. Um, one, one thing that has always struck me is that it, it is really fun to kind of do things your way. 
uh, to, to really put your stamp on it and to kind of, um, uh, you know, set, set your own rules a little bit. Um, on the other hand, you know, being, I think a, a good business person or, or certainly, um, a retail business owner means it's, it's really not, it's really not about you. Um, you know, it, it's about the customer and, um, and that's, it's, it, that's really what it comes down to. We have to kind of differentiate ourselves. We have to do something that's special and unique um, every day, every interaction to uh, maintain our position, I guess. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Blue Mountain Outfitters isn't really about me. Um, and so it's about our customers. And um, I think one of the things that has been an interesting challenge for me, uh, if I'm just being candid, uh, when I had questions, I didn't have somebody to go to. Uh, I didn't know, you know, I kind of missed having a boss in the sense that I just needed somebody to tell me like, Jim, you did that right. Or Jim, you totally screwed that up and you need to go and fix it. You know, I didn't know. I, I don't, I don't know. And so, you know, there were lots of things over the years were sort of like, I, I hope that was the right decision. I don't know. You know, I think, I think it's okay. Uh, but you know, I'm doing my best and that's as much as I can do. You know, I, that's an oft repeated refrain for me. Um, <laughs> and so I think I've learned a lot about myself because of that, you know? Um, and I think it's, it's been really rewarding and I'm also at a point where, um, in some ways I, I, built the business into what I wanted to build it into. And so I'm kind of excited at the possibility of seeing what somebody else could do with that. Um, and you know, what, what new ideas could come to the table. Um, I did, you know, I, I really tried to build it the best way that I could and, and meet customers needs as best as I could listening to customers. But, you know, there's plenty of other, opportunities and directions that it could go in. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really exciting about doing business in a community like this is that the options that are available are sort of endless um, in the sense that, you know, there's just sort of lots of different directions that something can go in. If I was in Portland, I would be fighting tooth and nail for uh, against, you know, a dozen competitors and, um, I wouldn't have quite the same room to experiment, if that makes any sense. And so I've really enjoyed having that here, um, even or especially when those experiments didn't always play out the way that I would have liked. But, um, you know, it's, it's been a great experience. And again, you know, I just, I, I credit Legrand with my success more than anything, because without uh, the community's sort of patience and support, um, you know, we wouldn't exist. I think it's really important to to note that businesses like mine aren't really supposed to survive in today's economy that well. You know, not really supposed to thrive for sure. And we have, and I think that that's more a function of the support that I've received from the community than it is a function of, you know, my capabilities. Um, I'm a reasonably competent uh, project manager and, you know, I try to kind of keep things going and, you know, maintain, uh, you know, keep the numbers up and whatnot. But uh, I really think that the people that have supported us uh, get, get the credit for it. Um, I've also been blessed with uh, some really, really great employees, some really great talent that's uh, come in and, um, I mean, Brent, you know, you know, know Elena uh, Carollo and, and she was an early ish. Uh, she, she came on board with Blue Mountain Outfitters about three and a half years ago, something like that. Um, and she really won up our, our social media game. Uh, Eric Lincoln came on soon after that. And he really was able to take ownership over a lot of the inventory that was on the floor and really understand things in and out. Um, you know, he's, he's the best gear nerd I could have, I could have hoped for. Uh, Carolyn Brandt came on soon after that. And she has been pretty amazing, uh, kind of really pushing the social media further and, and, you know, kind of, um, 
putting some infrastructure around our marketing and whatnot. It just, you know, I I am successful because of the community and the people that I've been lucky enough to to be surrounded by more than anything else. So, um, it's it's amazing. I I grew up in a self employed family, hmm. uh, and uh, my my dad was a landscaper and sprinkler system install guy, and <clears throat> so I knew uh, I knew how to service customers. I knew how to take care of them, but I didn't know much about the business side of things. And mm -hmm. so that was, uh, I mean, that was a real shocker when I jumped into it is I just, um, I knew what I wanted to do. I, you know, probably had I done a market analysis of it before I did it, it I, I wouldn't have done it. It would have scared me to death, you know, yeah. but, but yeah, there's, there's a tremendous amount of uh, reward in, being your own boss and calling the shots and so on and so forth. But at the same time, a lot of folks that are going to start a business, they don't understand that. Yes. As soon as you open a business uh, and you're a sole proprietor, then literally every customer that comes in the door, they're your boss. Yep. And, and uh, you, uh, if you, if you don't service them, if you don't meet their needs, then they're not going to come back. And, and yeah. And in a community like Eastern Oregon, uh, that's servicing the customer, finding out their need is, is incredibly vital. Um, so yeah, no, all, all you and I could talk about that for a long time. And, um, I guess the other thing is, is that, you know, you and I have sit on a lot of boards and a lot of committees together and, um, and I find, uh, personally, I think that entrepreneurs that start a business, there are, they are a unique breed and, um, it's, there's a vast difference between, um, uh, uh, getting a paycheck and having a boss. Um, and you know, you can make a big mistake and you might be disciplined, but you're probably still going to have your job. And, yeah. you know, when, when you make a mistake as a sole proprietor, uh, you're going to feel it. You're, you're, uh, it's, it, it possibly could make a difference, uh, in whether you're going to survive or not. So, yeah. 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 Um, we'll talk about a little bit, uh, how have you, how have you adapted, uh, how I, let's back up just a little bit. How did you adapt to competition, mainstream competition coming into town? And then, and then also talk a little bit about how you've adapted during COVID. Yeah. So, um, I think, one thing, so I said earlier, there isn't a lot of other outdoor stores between Boise and Tri-Cities. I'm fortunate that that is still true. Uh, and I, you know, mainly when I say that there isn't an REI, you know, uh, for a hundred miles. And that's probably the closest thing that we're modeled after. Um, and I would say that, you know, when Big Five showed up, it definitely worried me a little bit. I think I could see it in the numbers. Um, and I'll, I'm just, you know, my default setting is to be as transparent as possible. So hopefully I don't, uh, you know, uh, say the wrong thing here, but, uh, you know, I definitely saw it in the numbers. Um, they, when it comes down to it, they're still primarily in a different category than we are. Uh, not just cause they're mostly sporting goods, but also like their camping stuff is sort of, um, it's, it's a different tier than the one that we carry. Um, but I did, you know, start thinking about what I, you know, what I need, would need to do. Um, right before big five, I was starting to think about doing baseball bats and, uh, gloves and trying to get into sporting goods. And I was fortunate that I didn't make those investments. Uh, <laughs> it was literally like a matter of weeks, you know, uh, and, and when big five showed up, it was sort of like, oh, okay, well, you know, that, uh, that avenue, that vector of opportunity isn't, uh, isn't available. So I'm going to go find another one. Um, and so that's, I mean, really, we just kind of go back to the customers and keep focusing on that. Um, I think one thing, you know, you were talking about making sure that you're sort of following the customer. One thing that we've, that I've often had to strike a balance with is that 
I can't afford to carry every size and color of everything that I would like to carry or even that my customers would like me to carry. Um, I often find that, you know, when I get a lot of requests for one color, that isn't when I, and I bring that color in, suddenly that color isn't going anywhere. <laughs> I have right. to like, you know, I'm gonna have to fire sale it at the end of the season. It just, it just works out that way sometimes. And so there is a difficult part of this where customer is always right. It's really important to, you know, meet as many needs as we can, but then I also have to draw a line too. And that's tough because I'm sort of a people pleaser by nature. And so telling somebody like, you know, I can't afford to carry that or, um, you know, we're not going to be able to do that uh, is, is tough. Um, but at the same time, we also have, we're able to get a pretty good sense for what um, people are looking for just by, you know, uh, putting our ear to the ground, so to speak. Um, and so there's always those opportunities and we've, we've been able to find those. Um, but when it comes to um, big five, uh, you know, it, it, it's worked out well for us in some ways in that for a little while prior to them, um, and this is maybe, you know, a little bit too nuts and bolts, but, but, you know, we can do it for a minute, I guess the, uh, when we, for a little bit, we were, we were trying to cover some of the end of the sort of price point spectrum that they have. And when they came in, it kind of took that off of my plate in a sense. So I was able to start reinvesting my inventory into some of the, higher end stuff that, um, you know, I thought people were excited about and that's actually worked out pretty well for us. Um, you know, but there's still things that I'm going to be staying away from, you know, some folks have asked us for kayaks or for skis or whatever. And, you know, one thing that we always try to do is make sure that we complement rather than compete with, um, you know, other businesses in the community and definitely, you know, small businesses downtown. So we were always wary of that, but, a lot of that stuff requires a really big upfront investment and um, it's a lot of risk. And I'm sort of, one of the challenges for me is that I'm a very risk averse person and I don't, as an example, like I hate gambling, but sometimes it feels like my job is a lot like gambling because I'm kind of <laughs> saying like, you know, this jacket in this color, I'm going to put my chips on that, you know? And um, so I'm, I'm making, you know, lots and lots of kind of decisions like that all the time. And, and that can kind of, um, you know, it gets tricky. It, it, it wears on you, I guess. And so, you know, it, it, in a way it, it actually freed me up, uh, to, to explore other things. Um, COVID COVID, uh, has been pretty tough. Um, two things are, are happening with that for us. One of which is that, you know, I mentioned earlier, my wife is immunocompromised. And so I, I can't be in the store right now. Uh, if I bring it home to her, uh, you know, she, she could die. And so, um, I'm not able to be there and I, I'm not sure how to articulate all of this perfectly. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my best, but I really don't love that uh, retail has to stay open right now, um, that businesses like ours have to be on the front lines of this. Um, and so I've, I've tried pretty hard to, um, listen to my employees and make sure that we do everything we can to keep employees and customers safe. And, um, in some cases that has meant being closed when it was not, uh, formally or, uh, officially required for us to be closed. Um, and it has also meant, uh, implementing pretty significant, uh, I don't know, policies, restrictions, whatever in the store where, you know, we, we were closed for a couple of weeks at the end of June uh, when the outbreak really hit in Union County. Um, I was really worried about that for my staff, for my customers and for our community. And I also kind of felt a responsibility to um, 
do something to kind of, uh, you know, flatten the curve as, as they say. Um, I also, you know, when we reopened, we decided we were going to require masks and that was before that was Monday when we reopened and, uh, the governor came out with her requirement for masks a couple of days after that, which was kind of a relief because, uh, you know, it gave us another sort of leg to stand on with a policy that we knew would not be popular with all of our customers. And COVID has really put me in that position a lot where I've had to make decisions that I knew would make people unhappy. Uh, but for my own conviction or um, any number of reasons, I just decided that that was okay. And I, I needed to move forward, you know, based on those convictions. And so, um, in terms of the nuts and bolts of what to do, uh, during COVID, we, when we were closed, basically, uh, I was running deliveries for a while, um, and doing online orders, uh, or I should say I, I was running deliveries and kind of taking orders over the phone and, um, trying to figure all that out. Um, I was able to, for the first shutdown, I was able to do that to a degree on my own that allowed me to mostly uh, meet my overhead uh, costs. And so it was scary and it was kind of a scramble, uh, but um, you know, it worked out okay. And eventually I was able to find a way to build an online store, an e-commerce site. Um, and it's, I kind of, I don't know, it, it, it's a little bit, I kind of had to hack my way to it, I guess you could say, uh, because we have, I don't know, at last I counted, we probably have 7,000 active SKUs in the store, active individual items. Uh, and so, you know, we were in outdoor stores, you got, you got, you know, a three inch or a, you know, whatever, a, a three quarter inch buckle, uh, in two different colors and, you know, with two different, uh, you know, configurations on the buckle. And that means you have, you know, 12 different items in the system. And so taking those, that inventory and putting it onto an e-commerce site is, uh, well, you know, it, it's, I don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And I was able to figure out a way to kind of, uh, take that information and dump it into one repository and then have that repository feed the information into another place and then have it kick over to the e-commerce site. And before I knew it, I had an actual site and I never got into e-commerce because my assumption from the beginning was a, it would take resources that I didn't have. And I just, that was still my assumption. And then I kind of made it, figured out a workaround and then my other assumption was that nobody's going to go to bluemountainoutfitters.com. Like they're going to go to, you know, REI or they're going to go to Amazon or they're going to go to Backcountry. And um, that turned out to not quite be true. I've been able to, you know, sort of push uh, Google ads and stuff like that to um, tack on another, you know, it's not a ton, but like another chunk of business uh, that adds to the revenue so that we can kind of keep, uh, well, let's just say it, it supplements what we're losing because of COVID, um, because business has slowed. Um, but on the other hand, for the period that we have been open, when you include uh, the e-commerce side of things, we are solid relative to last year. And I think that that's one thing that's important for people to know is that like, the business is pretty strong still. Uh, and it's not, you know, COVID's hurt us because I've, chosen to be closed and COVID has hurt us because I've chosen to be maybe a little bit more restrictive than others in, you know, what, what we require in the store and all of that. But, um, you know, the same blessings that we walked into COVID with were, were are still active. Now we have customers that, uh, for all intents and purposes appear to be making a absolute point of, of helping us right now, you know, of, of just really, really pitching in. And so, uh, we're, we're very fortunate for that. And, um, you know, COVID is scary for me because 
I have no clue what's going to happen in the next week, you know, and I'm somebody who, again, I'm a little bit of a systems thinker. I want to set up a, a, a process and a projection and I want to work towards it. And, uh, you know, I want to set goals and all of that. And I just, I just can't do that right now. Right. Like how do you, how do you, you know, <clears throat> Like I have this elaborate cash flow model because I'm kind of an Excel nerd and I, you know, I can, I can plug in like, you know, if we have 5% growth, this is where I'm going to be at in January 1st and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, none of that has any relevance anymore because I have no idea what's, what's going to happen. And, right. you know, the world's operating according to a different set of rules. So, right. um, you know, it's, it's definitely challenging. Um, and that is the place where, what you described, that sort of unique weight that uh, you carry as a business owner, uh, where everything stops with you. Um, COVID really, really puts that under pressure. Uh, uh -huh. And I would say that's probably my, it's, it's really, it's been a very significant source of stress for me because I just, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this part. And uh, it keeps changing and I still don't know how to do it. And so it's, it's a big source of stress, but we're still, you know, we're, we're getting by just fine, uh, in a lot of ways. And it just, but it's also really scary and my employees are in there and we're, you know, having to require masks and it's a pandemic and, you know, it just, you know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot that, uh, there's just layers on layers of, of uh, complexity and, and things that uh, are just, you know, things to be worried about, I guess. So, you know, that I, sometimes I wonder, like, is my job to just sort of professionally worry all the time? Like, I <laughs> wonder if that's what it is. Like, I'm just here to anticipate bad things. I don't know. But, yeah. yeah. Well, I, um, I, I follow that. And I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, my I don't have a retail store. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, I mean, we have customers come in, you know, seldomly, you know, so most of what we do is uh, service oriented. We've, we've been able to, I don't think we've missed a lick because uh, closing the front doors did not change our business. You know, right. um, uh, everything that, everything that we do is, can be done just like, you know, we're talking here, um, and a along with that, everybody is needing to stream. Everybody's needing to do video. And so uh, we've been fortunate to be positioned uh, in this place uh, for, this, for this kind of uh, event. Um, I guess I'm curious to know, I want to pivot just a little bit. You know, I, I started my business here because I had had experience in media and so on and so forth. Um, in the past, I was looking to kind of reinvent a career, um, and uh, and I was committed to living in Lagrand, and so uh, I I grew up in Central Wyoming, and I mean cowboys are they're in my past. I have cowboy in my blood, and so uh, it was you know it was just get her done. I'm gonna start this business, and so on and so forth. Um. But I didn't really had a choice. I mean, I didn't have a choice to start the business somewhere else because uh, my family and my wife's parents were here, and this is where we had determined that we were going to settle. So you are kind of an interesting breed for me in the sense that uh, you you came from a more metropolitan area and chose to start a business in Lagrand, and you're a different kind of a business operator and have been certainly than what I've experienced. Um, you know, I, I remember the uh, first time my wife uh, bought something in your store and a few minutes later she got a text message with an offer. Uh, you know, you had, you, had, you had gathered the phone number at the transaction and you followed up and it's like, I mean, it's just, you are, you, you are way advanced and have been for a long time of many sole proprietor businesses in the area. Um, so I guess given all of that, I'm, I'm interested in knowing from an outside perspective, what does Legrand get right? What do we get right? What is it that is, what is our greatest asset? 
do you think? Um, because the, the bottom line is, is that unless we have businesses like yours that specifically are trying to tailor towards a younger population, uh, and, and we're encouraging that population to move in and make this place their homes. And uh, I'm involved a lot with projects recruiting professionals to come into the area and everybody is struggling with that same thing. So uh, maybe speak to that. You have a you kind of a unique experience, uh, a unique perspective, and I think that your opinion matters. You've you've earned the right to give your opinion because of your investment in the area. So I'm I'm kind of interested in that. Yeah, I think um, the the main thing that comes to mind for me is that I think that La Grand Eastern Oregon uh, has a pretty ingrained uh, shop local mentality uh, since way, way, way before it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, since way before American Express, you know, created a uh, small business Saturday and started sending us tote bags for Main Street and whatnot. Um, I think uh, that that is the main thing is that folks here seem to if if they can find the thing that they want locally and they can afford to buy it um, even if it's a couple bucks more or something like that they will uh, that that is that is the fundamental thing that at least is is my sense that is true of of my customers um, and you know they're willing to come in and put a special order in with me. I offer free shipping on it, but you know, it could take a couple more days than certainly it would if they did it on Amazon prime or something like that, but they're, they're willing to, you know, be okay with that. Uh, you go to bigger cities, um, and that level of connection just, just isn't there. Um, it's, it's something that has to be taught, you know, that, that when you shop local, you invest in your community. Uh, when you give, Blue Mountain Alphabetters five dollars, at least ten percent of that fifty cents. Uh, I ran the numbers recently. It's, it usually is ten percent of sales uh, end up going to uh, you know uh, the film festival or um, uh, uh, farmers market or something. Um, and so, you know, when you give me your money, you know where it's going to go. Um, and um, that, that is also how I've chosen to run the business, almost frankly, a little bit more like a nonprofit than a, you know, serious for-profit enterprise. Um, and so that, but I think that shop local thing is, is very unique and important. Um, the other thing, I, I guess when I, when I got here, I, I had come from big companies, working for big companies and what I was really enamored with was some of the idea of being um, an entrepreneur. And, you know, I don't know if I officially uh, qualify for that, for that. Uh, but I would say that I found myself looking at Legrand through a lens of what needs are not being met here that I could meet um, and that I could serve. And so, you know, you can take that to an outdoor store um, or you can take that to, I don't know, like why aren't there more Italian restaurants? I, I don't know, there, there should be, somebody should figure that out, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I kind of, you know, played with different ideas and so the barrier to entry there, it, it, the barrier to, let's call it uh, uh, untapped markets is, is fairly low in that sense. Um, you don't have to go far. You don't have to invent an iPhone to, you know, start a business in the grand. Right. So um, the other thing that, that I, I think about is that it's not that hard to start a business here. Overhead isn't that high rent. Isn't that expensive. I got a, you know, a, a storefront in the middle of Main Street 
for 700 bucks a month uh, on a corner and right, right in the middle of everything, you know? Uh, and, you know, when I tell that to my friends back home in Portland or whatever, they're like, that doesn't, you know, I mean, it'd be like $7,000 or whatever in Portland. Right. So, um, and so there's that part of it. And, you know, the other thing is, um, there's just, you know, again, I, I guess I don't want to belabor the point, but you know, again, that, that people have been patient with my learning curve. When I started, I, I, you know, because I didn't know the business at all and I didn't know how to start the business either. I didn't even know what it looked like, uh, to do this. And I just started calling brands and I would just say like, Hey, uh, you know, Marmot, can I, can I sell your stuff? And they would say like, well, who are you? Do you have a business license or, uh, you know, a, 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 a tax ID? I'm like, well, no, I don't want to go find one. And then I go find it. And then I call the next brand and I just keep doing it. And it was sort of a game to me. And then I realized like, oh, wow, now I have like 10 brands. I wonder, it was sort of like a, almost like a case study, you know, for my, for my master's program, sort of like, well, I got 10 brands. Okay. Maybe the next thing that you would do if you're going to start an outdoor store is go find a space. So I called up uh, <laughs> Ashley O'Toole and Ashley O'Toole helped me find the, the space that we're in now. He showed me a couple of places and he said, rent 700 bucks a month. And I was like, wow, that's not that difficult. Okay. What's the next step? And I just kept doing it. And you know, people help me along the way. And in some ways, like that's still sort of what we're doing today, just sort of, you know, testing it out as we go and, and making it work. And so, you know, if you kind of, you know, the, the shop local mentality, I think is absolutely essential. Um, and you just, you just don't get that um, everywhere. And that's, that's really, really important. And um, then just the sort of opportunities that are available are really important. And I think sometimes under recognized, I guess, um, and then, uh, just sort of the startup costs in a way, uh, are, are pretty low. Um, so for me, you know, th those are some of the major things that come to mind. Um, but you know, you also have a culture, uh, that I think is important that, uh, you know, we, we've got a little bit of university town in us. We've got a little bit of, I don't know, cowboy town in us, right? Like you were talking about. Uh, we've got a little bit of, um, you know, we, we are sort of an economic hub for Northeast Oregon, you know? Um, so there's, there's a lot of different components here that you can kind of tap into that I think are important. Um, one thing I feel strongly about is, is, I just have a fundamental disagreement with anybody that says that Legrand is a difficult place to do business in. Um, I just, I just, I haven't, I haven't found that uh, problem yet. So, um, the uh, I have found things that I, I think there are opportunities for, and so that's kind of what I've tried to pursue in in you know uh, my work with you on Main Street or um, you know on the city council too. So. Let's drill down for just a minute, uh, and it might not seem necessary, but it took me a long time to understand the numbers for shopping local, mm -hmm. and it's and using your business is is a good example. So, um, so you you buy inventory, you buy that at wholesale cost, and you sell that at retail. That's how that's how it works, and um, uh, you pay your employees. Uh, so then if I come, if I buy something at your store and let's say, uh, let's say it's a, 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 it's a hundred dollar item and I don't know exactly the percentages, but, but the point is, 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 uh, a, a portion of that money that I give you is going to, going to pay for that a item, the wholesale price of whatever that item was, but the, the profit from that item is staying completely in this community. Uh, so it's going to your employees they're, you're paying their wages and they're, they're going to go out to eat or whatever they're going to do, or they're going to pay rent. You're paying rent, uh, to, I, I, I know the owner of your building. You're paying rent to a, to someone who owns your building locally. And yep. that's going into, uh, his business or his pocket that he's going to spend somewhere else. The point being is, is the, the profit from that item is staying completely in this community. Okay, yeah. so now, now when you go to 
uh, let's say you go to a big box store, let's say Safeway or Walmart, whatever the case might be. So the profit from that item that they're buying, a portion of that profit is going to pay for the employees that are working at that place, yep. those local employees. And yes, so it does provide money in that it gives those people jobs and so on and so forth. And not to minimize that, they're, they, between the, you know, the, the stores that we have, they employ a lot of folks. But the profit, uh, the the profit above the employee, the payment that we're get, that they're the employees are getting is all going away. It's going to somewhere else. Uh, the profit for that product is going somewhere else. It's not being spent here. Uh, and now you take Amazon and you add that. Okay, well, Amazon does not have any local employees, and so uh, when you buy something online from a place like Amazon then a very small percentage of that ends up back in the local economy. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it, you know, it took me a long time. I don't know why, it, you know, I mean, people would say that a hundred times. What's the, what's the importance of uh, shopping local? Um, but it, it really does matter because uh, you're hiring in your case, your employees, you're paying them, they're spending money in this community, uh, all of their wages, depending on how they spending them are uh, it's invested in this community. Yeah. I, you know, I think I would say, and I, I don't want to get too philosophy major on you. Right. But <laughs> well, and, I, and you and I could talk cause uh, my, I had a, I have a degree right? in philosophy too. Yeah. 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 Right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I think our economic system is not good at accounting for the value of that, uh, of, of maintaining or, or keeping that value within the community. Um, our economic system is well attuned to an Amazon uh, finding a way to build an infrastructure that allows it to extract resources, revenue, whatever, uh, from as many different places as possible by making things as easy and as cheap as possible. Um, and so the value of keeping the money local um, isn't, you know, it, it requires that extra set of consideration. Um, and so, you know, kind of, you know, with what I was saying before, like that doesn't come naturally to anybody but it seems to come more naturally to people here than it does to the other, the people that I've been around in other places, you know? Um, and, you know, like in Los Angeles, I, you know, I was, I was struck by when I lived down there, I wasn't really a great fit for LA, but it, you know, it, it really feels like everything to me sometimes is, was, was a chain down there. And, um, you know, whereas here you have some of that, but you also have really unique, uh, businesses all over the place. Um, you know, uh, there, there's so many that, that come to mind, you know, Bella, Jack's dog, there, there's so many things that are completely one of a kind here, uh, that, that people don't realize maybe, you know, the, the sort of, uh, wealth and value of that, but, um, that extra set of considerations of like, well, I can give my money to, uh, you know, Amazon, uh, if, if I really need it, or I can give my money here, but I know that if I give my money to Blue Mountain Outfitters that again, a few of those dollars are going to go to the film festival. Uh, and you know, because they share my values and, and, you know, one thing I've always said is that, um, probably the most exciting thing that I learned early on was that marketing dollars if I could divert more of my marketing budget to local events uh, and causes and organizations, um, that if I can get my logo on the banner for the farmer's market or uh, in the Eastern Oregon Film Festival, um, then I am telling everybody in that festival that Blue Mountain Outfitters like cares about this thing. You care about this thing and we care about this thing. And if you give us your money, we're going to, we're going to put something towards it. Right. Um, and that a dollar spent with on the film festival could actually be a better 
it could have a better ROI, a better return on investment than a dollar put into um, you know traditional advertising or something. Uh, and that that blew me away, and it was so exciting because it's sort of like that's that's wonderful, you know, like that's so that's great, and and I was really excited by that. I'll 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 tell you a quick story. Um, when I first moved here, and I I didn't know that much about. Le Grand, and I was excited about it. Uh, it seemed pretty cool, but I hadn't really like, you know, I was just here for a couple months. And um, I went to the film festival and I didn't, I didn't know anybody. I just got, I, I got my own pass and I went by myself and I went to a bunch of movies and I just thought, man, this is the coolest thing. I just, I can't believe that this culture is here and that, you know, you've got so many people willing to watch weird movies together. That's really cool, you know? Um, and uh, I wouldn't have expected that. And so when I, I thought that was really neat. And then when I started the business, almost exactly, you know, uh, a year, well, I, I don't remember, but, you know, the next film festival rolls around and I am now the owner of Blue Mountain Outfitters. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I, I just like the film festival. At this point, I didn't know about, you know, this idea of, of diverting marketing dollars to local causes. And I, Gave, you know, I, I put in some money for, for a sponsorship. And I will never forget that I was late to like the main showing. And because I was closing the store, I was, I was doing most of it by myself at that time. And so I was closing up the store and I ran down there. It's like 6.05. And I, uh, first, they won't let me in because I'm late. I finally get them to let me into the showing. And I sat down and it was, it was in, you know, the Granada and it was in the main theater and it was packed. And I sat down just in time for them to start announcing the sponsors. And they announced Blue Mountain Outfitters as one of the main sponsors. And the whole room started cheering. And they said, like, literally, they started chanting Blue Mountain Outfitters. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, <laughs> like this is incredible, you know? And I, like, I actually kind of teared up because it was sort of like, this is this is this is what I wanted. This is what I've been wanting the whole time. The 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 local uh, community connection, having you know, Blue Mountain Outfitters has often just sort of been a platform for that for me, or at least in the early days, it certainly was. And um, I was just blown away by, you know, that that I could kind of use the business to that end, I guess you could say, and and that it would also be appreciated in that way. And so that really kind of you know, guided how I operated a lot, you know, from, from there on in a lot of ways. Wow. Very cool. So, um, so if you, if you had some friends or young professionals, uh, that could move, they were looking for someplace different to move to, they were tired of being in the city. Uh, what would you, what would you tell them as good about living in the Grand? Why? Why would they? Why should they consider moving here? Well, um, I will. I will choose to sort of focus my answer on a little bit more of the cultural side of things and kind of what's unique about the community. I think. Like it goes without saying that our outdoor recreation opportunities are incredible, um, and um, I'm well. I imagine that many of the people that are that might be watching this are are used to hearing me sort of evangelize about that. So I will uh, take that as a given, and um, <laughs> you know maybe speak a little bit more to um, you know. I would just say that that. You can kind of build your own way here in a way that, that you can't in bigger cities. Um, obviously, the cost of living is a lot lower. Um, and, you know, again, there's just a really unique culture here. Um, and, you know, there, there's an interestingly, there is a kind of diversity to our community that I think it, sometimes we we undercount. Um, we have a lot of different. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this very well, but I'm going to I'm going to take a shot at it anyway. Um, you know, in, in the last several weeks and months, we've seen um, 
protest downtown for uh, Black Lives Matter. And I was a participant in one of those. And we've also seen, you know, we obviously have um, a pretty strong, um, you know, conservative contingent here. We have a, a very strong faith-based uh, contingent here. We have the university. We have uh, downtown business owners. We have uh, larger industry, uh, trailer factory, et cetera. We have Walmart. Um, there's a lot going on here, you know, and there's a lot of people with different angles on things, you know, figuring it out and getting along, doing, doing their best, you know? Uh -huh. And I think that th sometimes we don't realize that, that, that we discount ourselves as a small town, um, right. a, a small town with, you know, uh, without diversity, um, you know, whether, whether it's, uh, racial, economic, uh, thought, you know, uh, faith, any of it. Um, but I think that there's more, more to us than that. I just, I just do. Um, and you know, in some ways that, that experience with the film festival w was a big part of pulling back the curtain on that is that, you know, there, there is that surface level, but there's a lot more underneath that. And, um, I, I guess in a way, like I try to operate against that surface level assumption, uh, both in how we run the business um, and, you know, never like I do drive my employees crazy. I can be a little bit of a perfectionist and it's like, it, no, it has to be, it has to be as good as it can be. Um, and it doesn't matter. We're a small business in a small town. It does, it's not even relevant. You know what I mean? Right, our our customer right. deserves the best that we can give them. Um, and and we don't ever, you know, um, discount that. Uh, that's sort of a fundamental value for us. And so anyway, I guess I, I think that there is that part of it is is important is that um, there's just a lot more going on here than sometimes uh first you know meets the eye or maybe that you would assume i, I don't know if that if, if that's no, clear, but yeah no that's that's awesome and i and i agree with that you know and i um i think it i think it's necessary uh there is a lot of variety uh i think that sometimes uh in our culture whatever it might be you know i'm i i lean conservative grew up in a conservative family, a religious family, and so on and so forth. But uh, if you are a thinking person, if you are a compassionate person, you have to be open to thought. For me, I'm constantly checking my values. I'm constantly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm checking to, I'm, I still want to be a learning person. Because if you're not a learning person, then you're still... Um, and I, and, you know, so that personal experience and I, that drives my business also, you know, is, is that you, you do, you have to be able to focus and, and pivot and change. And you have to be able to do that personally. You know, when I, I covered, uh, the protest a few weeks ago and I mean, that was a different experience for me. I, mm -hmm. I've never been to a protest in my life, yeah. let alone, you know, let alone carried a camera through it, you know, and, but what, but what was uh, funny to me was is that, yeah, it was a La Grande protest, though. I mean, most of the people had masks on, but many of them I knew. And you could see them smiling underneath their masks. You could see, you know, and so there was, uh, I, I don't know, I thought that was unique. There was a unique unity even in the midst of that somewhat divisive atmosphere, you know. And uh, I really, uh, I mean, I, I, I love that. I, I love that, that people can come from different perspectives, have different belief systems, and, but yet they can still be friends. They can have coffee together. They can still celebrate, you know, the 80 or 85 or 90% of the things that they have in common. Uh, and, man, I, I wish, I wish it a lot of our world would be able to do that right now because it seems like we're missing that in a number of different places. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, I've worked with you on multiple boards. I, you know, we had, you know, kind of our, uh, I don't know what the web show TV show thing that we did with Will for a couple of years, I think. Yeah. 
Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I've, I've worked with you on council stuff too. And uh, I mean, that's the thing is that everybody collaborates towards the same end for the community, uh, yep. ideally. And, um, you know, we don't, we don't have to disagree on it or we don't have to agree on everything. Uh, that's not necessarily relevant to, to that part of it. Uh, and, you know, if anything, you can continue to have the civil sort of discourse, um, and that's okay. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I've seen that a lot with city council experience too. And in a way that's only affirmed it for me even, even more. So, yeah, well, let's, let's pivot a little bit to your plans and, um, uh, what is your doctorate in? What, what are you interested in pursuing? And then, um, I'm interested in you and I talked a little bit before we were live about uh, an example of some of the things that you're interested in doing some research in. And I think that kind of tied in a little bit to when we were talking about uh, local or business yeah. and and how that is not always, uh, it's not always the best thing for local business. I don't know, kind of launch, tell us a little bit about what you're wanting to do, what your plan is with your degree and so on and so forth. Sure, yeah, so the, um It'll basically be a, a PhD in, in business. Uh, they, the specific name of the program is, or title, whatever, Strategy, Innovation, and Leadership. Um, it's uh, basically for the next five-ish years, I will be, um, do, I'll be sort of teaching half-time and then um, studying and um, doing research uh, and so I have some specific areas of research interest, um, and you know, primarily this is sort of an entry into um, an academic career, I guess. And so, uh, long term, I, I definitely am very excited to teach. Um, and one of the things that I do want to focus on in that, or that I'm looking forward to, you know, thinking about is. Um, Applying some of the method uh, of philosophy to business, especially early on uh, when students are, are really getting into those programs. And so one of those is just really thinking about why are we, why are we building this business? What, what are we building towards? Why, why are we doing it this way? Um, and being very purposeful about the values and goals that we pursue and you know what i what i think we have a lot of interesting examples of right now are businesses that um started with a certain set of values and evolved over time into a place that i think you could say is is uh maybe a long distance away from those values, uh, right? So um, I think, you know, some, some easy examples uh, that have only gotten easier uh, since COVID probably. <laughs> um, you know, when Facebook started, uh, it was kind of a hacker culture and they were really, really smart kids, mostly uh, young white guys. And uh, they, their their stated cultural value was uh, to move fast and break things, and there's a degree <laughs> to which they sort of stuck by that, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, it's interesting to see how that evolved over time and why. And and part of you know, there's there's a lot of things that can kind of like intervene in the success of a business um, or direct it in one place or another. And an interesting part of their particular history is that Mark Zuckerberg runs the whole show, including the board, and he's got all the voting shares. You know, it's just like it's it's um, and and it's there's no uh, there hasn't been as much outside influence on them as there has been other companies. Um, and so, you know, you also look at Google, and they're they were also very smart young people uh idealistic maybe more idealistic than uh, than zuckerberg i guess uh but um their initial model was don't be evil <laughs> and i mean again you know it sounds nice it's it's kind of a fun thing to say but it does it what does it really mean and i don't i don't know you know 
that it led them to a place that they initially intended. Um, and so what, what I'm interested in is, is you start with this thing that you say about yourself and then you progress and you evolve and people invest in your company and they tell you what to do or you have to figure it all out yourself or you shut everybody out or COVID-19 happens uh, and you have to redirect again. And you know, Blue Mountain Outfitters has redirected multiple times. When I started the business, I initially planned on it being kind of like a mid to even higher end boutique type store. Uh, where we'd carry like cool new brands and some of the expensive stuff. Um, and it became clear to me that I had sort of, you know, what that would be a way of differentiating myself from a more general outdoor store. But then I almost underestimated the opportunity because there wasn't a general outdoor store in the first place. And so I actually needed to pivot that way and um, become a little bit more, entry level or something um, or to cover a little bit more ground there anyway. And so the business that I ended up with was much different. Also, you know, I had planned on carrying, you know, lots of gear and it turned out that, you know, I can carry lots of really nice, I can sell lots of really nice tents, but I can also sell lots of really nice sundresses, you know, and I, I, had to figure out how to buy sundresses, you know, and um, that, that and, and over time, if I'm being honest, like the sundress side of the business sort of has evolved into uh, the more profitable end of things. Um, yeah. And so, you know, again, I didn't plan on opening a sundress store. I had to figure out how to, you know, uh, know what the difference was between a shelf bra and, you know, why that was in a, in a whatever. Anyway. You, yeah. You know, and a, and, a, and a, Elena probably helped you with that though too, right? She really, really helped me a lot with that. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Elena really, really helped me out. I, uh, I was shooting in the dark, and um, you know, she she did that. And also, I might add, she is responsible for your uh, wife getting that text message. Uh, oh. She, Elena, introduced the idea of the rewards program. So, oh. um, again, I, I when I'm at my best, I'm probably just a uh, frictionless conduit for good ideas. You know, um, so. Uh, Anyway, my interest is in, you know, the evolution of organizations over time um, and finding ways to get people who are interested in business to think purposefully about how they want that process to unfold if they want to get involved in, you know, business basically um, and to think critically about those things. And, you know, and it's again, it's, it's not so much about, you know, getting people to care about the environment in a certain way so much as it is just like, just be thoughtful about it. Be think, you know, think about it carefully. You know, what, what do you want to stand for? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, pursue that. Uh, and, you know, I think the core of what Blue Mountain Outfitters started with uh, has remained and I'm, I'm fortunate in that, in that way. So, yeah. Good. Now your wife teaches at EOU. Mm -hmm. Are, are you wanting to teach at the college level also? Is that kind of a, I mean, is that kind of a hope that you guys are going to be able to teach sometime at the same institution? I mean, have you, have you thought about that a lot at all? Yeah. I mean, Naomi uh, has been teaching in the education department at, at EOU for a few years now. And um, I can't understate, I can't overstate uh, how important she has been in, in how I think about these things. Uh, and, you know, she, she is truly a, uh, I don't know, she, she has such an incredible sense for um, best practices and, and where things are going and, and where they should go and how to direct them and uh, maintain sort of the inspiration of her students. And um, I admire that. And, uh, it, it is essentially what I eventually aspire to. Yes, uh, I, I want to work with students, and, and that's that's really uh, what I um, what my goal is. I think I am a reasonably effective uh, a teacher, or I don't know, whatever imparter of information. Um, I'm not always the greatest manager, but when I'm at my best, the inspiration level of my of my employees is is really really a, it's it's 
my highest priority behind customer satisfaction. Um, and so, um, that, that is, you know, where, where I want to go. I don't, you know, as far as teaching the same institution, I, I can't speak to that too much, but, uh, she'll be staying with EOU when we, when we, uh, she'll continue to teach at EOU when we're in Corvallis and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how, where we go from there. So. Wow. Well, I, I, I've, I've told you a couple of times, I just really appreciate you and your investment. I, rep- I appreciate your thoughtfulness, um, you know, and that, um, that is always, uh, I just admire that. I mean, and, and there are several people on the city council and I just, um, I, that I, I love watching them think. Mm. I, uh, and, and there's a, there's a tremendous amount of integrity in a thought process when someone is vulnerable and they share that process. And then, so then at least someone observing that they kind of understand how it is that they landed at that decision. And, and you're just, you're one of those people. And I just, uh, I really appreciate the integrity of your thoughtfulness, I guess is the best way to say that. And I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 You've, uh, uh, and, and the investment that you've made. Uh, I remember one of the film festivals that, that I went to was probably the next year after that one. And, you know, and you were giving away, um, I don't know, a 500 or a $750 package, uh, of outdoor stuff, you know, and, um, you know, you, you definitely, uh, invested and, and, and all of that just makes a huge difference in our community. And it makes a difference in a way that, you know, I mean, like I said, the, the cowboy side of me, made what I do organic. Uh, I just, I just kind of arrived here. I just kind of been fighting my way through. And, you know, part of that is just, that is how business is done. You, you make mistakes and you change directions and you meet the customer's needs and their needs change and your competition changes. And, you know, a lot of those same things I have experienced, but uh, I've just appreciated uh, the thoughtfulness that I've seen that I, you know, you've, you've, you've come at it from a different angle and that experience as I've watched you has, has helped expand that side of me that never would have been, that never would have been expanded, you know? And so that's, that's just awesome. We need that, you know? Well, I appreciate that. I, uh, I will take a moment to, to stump for, um, anybody that might be interested in, uh, in, in, putting in for my council seat. I, I really want to encourage folks to do that. Um, I, uh, I, it's been, a, it's, it's been a much more challenging and rewarding experience, uh, than I, than I think I had expected. Um, and it's, it's a really, you know, if I, if I put it a little too strongly to be provocative, uh, for, for those that have strong, um, criticisms of the city that, that getting involved to that degree, really stepping up to it and kind of putting your money where your mouth is, is, um, is, is really important. Uh, and I really encourage people to do that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. You know what I mean? Uh And, um, you know, we, we need as many people pitching in as possible and we don't always get it right on council, but you know, I, I've really been impressed and and I've really enjoyed with working with the other counselors and the mayor and the city manager. Um, and I, you know, it, I sometimes think my passion got away from me in a few meetings, maybe, you know, I, I, (laughs) I <laughs> wasn't sure. I, you know, I found myself just kind of like pounding the table, you know, proverbially, and I couldn't tell if anybody was listening anymore. But um, I, I, you know, when I was at my best, I think it, it, uh, I was really able to um, accomplish a lot. And, um, but there, there's still, there's still a lot left to do. And so I encourage anybody who's interested to, to really think about um, stepping up to that. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it was a really, it was one of the, you, you did it gradually, you know, you right. were, um, you were involved in main street for a number of years and then you were on the planning commission, if I remember right, yep. uh, which, uh, is probably the most 
complicated of all of the, what do they call those committees? I don't know, yeah. you know, to jump into, because uh, there's a, so much homework that has to be done in order for you to even make a decision. And then, I mean, and then from there, and I think you were on a budget committee uh, and then finally ran for, uh, for city council. So it's not, you know, they don't, people don't have to do it all at once. Uh, there's just lots of places where they can inject themselves. And yeah, you're right. I've, you know, I've been recording the city council meetings now, I don't know, probably nine years, I think. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm always amazed at the people that are critical and they're like, okay, I'm going to be on that committee and I'm going to change things by golly, you know? And then once they get into it and they, they like, uh, they, like, let's say they're critical of the budget or how the city is spending money. And then, yeah. and then they've got to wade through a four inch binder and every detail that they want to know is right there. They just have to put in the time to find the deal. And, you know, and it's, it's way more complicated than what people understand. And you know my my little preaching stump is is that I, I get I get really tired of uh, people being you know they they think the city council member is you know they're they're getting something out of it or you know and uh, and and I mean it's the same thing it's like it's our police officers or our city council members or commissioners or whatever the case may be all of those people are people who who are among us and they raised their hand and said, yeah, I will do that, you know, but they're still us. Uh, they, they are us. It's just, they're in a position that affects us. And, and, you know, they don't have a side agenda. They're not getting money on the side, you know, and, and I just, it really aggravates me when, and, and it, it's happened a lot right now in this yeah. culture is, is that the people that serve us, if we disagree with them, we say, oh, yeah, but, you know, we separate them from us. They're not us anymore. They're, you know, they're somebody else. And it's, yeah. it's irritating. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, there is an aspect of public service that I found where, like, especially with city council, by the time something gets to the city council, a decision, a, you know, vote, whatever, um, it's usually because there was some sort of um, it, it's, it's been escalated to the city council, right? Like it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't able to be decided uh, at the commission level or um, you know, it's, it's usually there because it's a difficult question and it's usually there when it gets there, it means that we're going to have to make a decision potentially that if, you know, if there are two sides, one side isn't going to be happy or more often than not, both sides are going to be at least a little unhappy, you know? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so there is a, there is a kind of thankless aspect to it there where like, you know, it's, we're, we're necessarily dealing with things that are more controversial and, um, you know, there, that, that it's, that's kind of, you know, it, it just, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, they're, they're the more contentious issues. And so, um, but there, you know, that, that's also exactly what I signed up for, you know, that, that mm -hmm. and, and it's also a really great way to have a meaningful impact on the community to, to really right. try for those things. I, I was really struck by, you know, when we had the, uh, the really big, uh, uh, meeting at the, at the middle school, uh, for the warming station and right. just so many people so engaged in that conversation. And, you know, yes, there, there was some, I don't know finger pointing or something. Um, but both sides came together and, you know, said their piece and move forward with the decision. And, you know, I just, in a way was really blown away by our community in that instance where it was a hard thing and not everybody was going to walk away happy. And it seemed like for the most part, folks were okay with that, you know, that, that, um, you know, we, we just, we, we have to make the decision and, and we move on and we live with it and we, you know, figure out what the next right thing is. Um, just keep doing the next right thing. And <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, you know, the next right thing. I mean, it, I think that, I mean, it's most recently been in a cartoon frozen too, if I believe right, you know, and, but man, what a good saying, the next right thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's uh, cause there's a lot right now that we, 
we do not know, you know, and so, and in business is that way. You're, you're right. You're taking it. I mean, I'm thankful that I'm not gambling on what sundress is going to sell, but, <laughs> right. but, yeah. but, but still, yeah, you know, you're, you're constantly uh, refocusing or repositioning and you are, you're, you're taking a risk as a business owner. So, yep. well, well, Jim, thanks for taking the time uh, to, uh, to service and thanks for taking the time tonight and uh, we're, we'll sure be thinking about you guys uh, and again I just really appreciate uh, your investment in the community personally your time uh, is there anything you want to say before we quit no I, I mean I just you know I I want to make it clear that the most you know we're, we're just I'm, I'm really really thankful and uh, to Legrand and I don't I want, uh, I hope anything that I've accomplished is more, is something that I can leave behind and that, you know, any, you know, folks can build on, um, you know, certainly the business included. And, um, you know, I don't, um, uh, I just, I, I look forward to, to seeing where, where Legrand goes from here. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll certainly be coming back frequently and, um, you know, I, um, I just, I'm, I'm very, very thankful for everything the community has done for me, for my family, for, um, for my business. So, yeah, thank yeah. you. And, and the business is for sale. It is. Yep. Yep. All We're right. trying to find a, a, a buyer for it. Um, and, um, yeah, hoping to find somebody that, uh, is as excited about it as I am and, you know, hopefully can bring some, some new ideas and, and, uh, excitement to it as well. Um, cause you know, like I say, I, I, in a way, like I've, I've done the best that I can do with it. And I'd love to see somebody take that and, and push it in new directions that, that can better serve our customers uh, than I can. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I have no doubt that, that there's somebody out there that can do that. Somebody in this community that can do that. And so I'm, uh, I'm very excited to, to see, um, you know, what, uh, what comes of that as well. Right. Well, thanks so much, Jim. And, uh, uh, Thank you, EO Alive, for tuning in tonight. And I always want to thank our sponsors, Grand Ronde Hospital and EONI, for uh, uh, keeping these kind of events going. We'll uh, see you next time. Mm -hmm.